what happened was a relatively sophisticated cover-up. What, what does that mean? Does that mean that there, there was no massacre? That Meaning that the UN didn't have enough uh, facts. If we walk in the mountain, we just walk on the dead body. Muslims are not going to be able to do that. They are In May of 2015, a mass grave of over 30 bodies was uncovered in an abandoned human trafficking camp in southern Thailand. The site is believed to be one of many dotting the area. These graves are at the end of an intricate transnational human trafficking route that has its origins in an ethnic conflict and state-sanctioned oppression in Myanmar that has reached alarming new heights since 2012. In recent years, Hundreds of millions of dollars have been made in Southeast Asia by selling desperate people as property, with thousands held for ransom in makeshift jungle prison camps, and at times tortured, enslaved, or killed, all of it done with the cooperation of high-ranking officials from multiple governments. And as internal United Nations documents obtained by Vice News show, concerns regarding crimes against humanity and the potential for additional mass atrocities are being swept under the rug in favor of political expediency. Meanwhile, investments have been pouring into Myanmar, and the country has been called the last big economic frontier. The U.S. State Department has even championed the democratic reforms as a major success story. We fully recognize and embrace the progress that has taken place. But while the world focuses on Myanmar's transition toward democracy, the government has actually enacted a system of apartheid in regards to an ethnic Muslim minority called the Rohingya. There's been a lot of excitement over what's been happening in Myanmar the past few years, as reforms have swept the country and the people have been granted a whole lot more freedom. But here in Rakhine State, things are pretty different. The Rohingya people have been rounded up into squalid camps where they've languished for years. We met up with a Rohingya community leader named Ong Wing in a camp near Sitwe. Why do you think the government is doing this to the Rohingya? So government is uh, still doing nothing for the Rohingya. They were, they, they declared that you know, there is no Rohingya, so they do not want to talk about with the Rohingya. So we were separated and we have no one to have us, you know. So, so we are, have no future here. According to the government, you and your people, you don't exist. Yeah, according with the government policy, we cannot exist, uh, you know, in Myanmar as a Rohingya people. So we are not uh, uh, like a human being. They treat us as an animal. They have no hope here, no job, nothing, nothing, you know. How, uh, how can I men mention the situation? I am also facing very difficulties here. So my family is suffering. I am living here. What is my family life? You can't see them. We are not allowed to go free to Rangoon. So how can I uh, reunite with my family? In all of the camps, Rohingya face heavy restrictions and are forbidden from leaving. The camps have been referred to as refugee camps or internally displaced persons camps but they are, essentially, internment camps. We're heading to an area called Pak Tao. The situation there is supposed to be quite drastic. Because it's far out of the way, most people don't get there, and access is restricted. The Get Chong camp near Pak Tao is about an hour boat ride from the nearest city, and just one of the many camps where Rohingya are forced to live under the strict control of the government. The Rohingya are a Muslim minority concentrated mostly in Rakhine State and across the border in Bangladesh. They have long suffered discrimination at the hands of the government, who see them as foreign invaders despite their long history of living in the area. In 2012, the gang rape and murder of a Rakhine Buddhist girl sparked a bloody conflict between the Muslim Rohingya and the Buddhist Rakhine people who make up the majority of Rakhine State. 
Historic ethnic tensions between the groups resurfaced, and the conflict spiraled out of control. Entire villages were burned to the ground as both groups attacked each other. Even more troubling, the police and state officials largely stood by, and in some cases participated in the attacks on the Rohingya. The destruction left tens of thousands of Rohingya homeless and resulted in what Human Rights Watch has called ethnic cleansing. 140,000 Rohingya were moved into government-built camps, and the mass displacement has given way to a new set of human rights abuses. If you look out, there's, there's just these camps and, and nothing anywhere else. It has a very end-of-the-earth type feel here right now. The camps receive little aid. Foreign NGOs who work with Rohingya face severe restrictions. Some have been attacked by Rakhine extremists, and others have been forced out of the region. Here in Get Chong, there have been shortages of basic needs like clean water and food, and there are barely any medical services available. Can you tell us what's happened to your uncle? What will you do now? Nazar's uncle passed away shortly after. Abuses against this population have been going on for decades. So we're talking about forced labor, killings, torture. Uh, going back to 1982, the government of Myanmar stripped the Rohingya of their citizenship status. So they now constitute the world's largest stateless population within a given country's borders. Matthew Smith is the founder and executive director of Fortify Rights, a nonprofit human rights organization that documents abuses against the Rohingya. Is the government of Myanmar, are they complicit in this? The government would love for the world to believe that what's happening in Rakhine State is a situation of communal violence. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. The, the abuses that we've documented and the abuses that have been happening for decades, these are abuses by the state. And in some cases, the abuses go straight to the top. So we're talking about key government ministers. Uh, we're talking about uh, the highest levels of government in Myanmar. It is a police state. It's fair to say that it's, a, it's an apartheid state, particularly in northern Rakhine state. Um, there are roads for Buddhists, roads for Muslims. Um, Muslims are not allowed to leave their village without permission. And in Rakhine State, the government seems to be preparing to keep the Rohingya in these camps much longer. We're in an entrance area to the camps. Behind me is a new police battalion area that's being built where a battalion will be staying. You can see that, that they're not really planning on having the Rohingya leave the camps anytime soon, uh, which leads into the fact that people think that they're, they're here, they're permanent. Outside of the camps, the city of Sitwe moves along with one major difference. No more Rohingya live there, except for those in a fenced-off ghetto away from the center of town. Fear and distrust of the Rohingya is commonplace. Some Buddhists in Myanmar fear a Muslim population boom and see the Rohingya as illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, hell-bent on taking over their country and threatening its Buddhist identity. A small number of our kind Buddhists also lost their homes in the 2012 fighting. And we headed to the fairly well-kept camps they live in to talk with them about the situation. Do you think that the two communities could ever live together in peace again? But where exactly has this fear come from? Some political and religious leaders, including Buddhist monks, 
have spread distrust of Muslims in an effort to increase their popularity and push people towards a more hardline stance and towards more hardline political groups. Though his influence has waned, Wiratu, a Buddhist monk who serves as a spiritual leader of the popular Buddhist extremist political organization Mabata, has been one of the most vocal anti-Islam proponents. <laughs> So basically what you see here is uh, photos of Wiratu with uh, jihadi types uh, holding um, a photo of him that says wanted, um, burning some effigies of him, and then additionally uh, photos of crimes committed by Muslims all over the world. Um, some Islamic State photos, uh, things along those lines, and that's part of the message that he spreads uh, to all his followers through social media and through his preaching um, that all Muslims represent a threat. What is it that people are misunderstanding about the situation? ဟိုတော်ဟိုတော်မုဆလင်နေရဲ့မခမရနိုင်ဖြစ်တာ <laughs> You know, we saw what happened uh, in Jakarta, in Indonesia recently. Um, you've got the photos out there of all the jihadi stuff. Is there, is there fear here of Muslims? Speaking out against the Rohingya garners massive popular support, and anyone attempting to help them is met with strong opposition, leaving them to fend for themselves. With many Rohingya eager to escape by any means possible, human traffickers have taken advantage of the desperate situation in the camps. In the spring of 2015, the world was stunned when hundreds of Rohingya refugees and some Bangladeshi migrants were stranded at sea in horrific conditions on overpacked boats. Abandoned by human traffickers after a partial crackdown by the Thai government, the boats were at first denied entry by all countries in which they sought refuge. It was a small glimpse at the plight of what the United Nations has called one of the most persecuted minorities in the world and a glaring reminder of just how unwanted the Rohingya are. Today, the flow of Rohingya trying to escape Myanmar by sea has slowed in the wake of the crackdown. Very little, however, is being done to get at what's causing the Rohingya to leave in the first place. This is Mahmoud. He's 17 years old and was rescued from a trafficker after spending 12 days on a boat last summer. His parents paid the equivalent of $413 after they were promised he'd be taken to a job in Malaysia. Walk us through the process of when you decide to go, how it works, and how you end up on the big boat. What were the conditions like on the on the boat? Then 
When you were on the big boat, did you think at one point that you were going to die? Mahmoud is just one of the tens of thousands of Rohingya who have been smuggled or trafficked since 2012. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees puts the number as high as 160,000. We're here at the western edge of the camps, uh, facing the Bay of Bengal. And these three ships right here, these are used by traffickers. It's the first step in the trafficking process. People are loaded into these boats before they're taken about 20 miles into the sea where there are giant boats waiting. Those boats are loaded extremely full, and then they make the journey to Malaysia or Thailand. The trafficking operations are actually quite complex. Wealthy investors, many of them in Bangkok, Bangladesh, or Kuala Lumpur, will purchase a large boat. These boats are sent to the western coast of Rakhine State, where they anchor offshore in international waters, close to Sitwe or further north in Mongdao. The ship captain or other operatives within the syndicates contact local brokers in Rohingya communities, who round up and recruit people to fill the boat. They're paid by commission, and they tell desperate Rohingya that they'll travel safely to Malaysia, where they'll have a job waiting. The Rohingya are put on small boats, Payments are made to local authorities so they can get through. The small boats keep coming until the big boat is dangerously overpacked. If you're the first group to board, you could be stuck in horrific conditions until the ship fills up, which can take weeks. Once the Rohingya get on, everything is taken from them. Sometimes, they're given different colored bracelets when they get on a ship. Each color represents a different trafficker. So if a Rohingya is wearing a green bracelet, they are now owned by the trafficker who was assigned the color green. The syndicates may share the boats, but the human cargo belong to different traffickers. Once the large boats are full, they make their way to Thai waters and dock throughout southern provinces, near the Malaysian border, to unload their property. In some cases, vehicles operated by Thai officials are alleged to have escorted them. In others, Thai immigration authorities are alleged to have taken Rohingya into custody and then sold them to traffickers. Once these ships made their way to Thailand uh, en route to Malaysia, usually this human cargo, and they were regarded as human cargo, would be herded into these remote camps in the jungle, held in a situation of captivity, and they would essentially be held for ransom. They'd be handed a telephone, and they'd be told, you need to raise $2,000 for your freedom, or we will either kill you or you will die here. Or another option would be to sell them off to a situation of slave labor. This was a cold, calculated business in the trade of human beings, men, women, and children. And they were making so much money that they had little regard for their human cargo that was dying, and, and in some cases in, in large numbers. Southern Thailand, where the mass graves were found in the spring of 2015, has been a trafficking hotspot where well-established gangs and criminal enterprises have connected with human traffickers. We met with a police informant familiar with the human trafficking system. His identity has been concealed for his safety. We know that there have been some mass graves discovered in Southern Thailand. Are there, do you think there are more mass graves around here? Are there more people that have been killed that, that haven't yes, been discovered? Yes, sure. Some of the government officers, they inform local authority to stop digging the graves because if they, they dig many graves, then international community and uh, also the other countries, they can see the, some of the evidences with dead bodies. So it will not be good for Thai reputation. So you know of other undiscovered mass graves that are around here? In the mountain, the, there will be uh, many graves. If we walk in the mountain, we will just uh, walk on, on, the, on the dead body. Matt Smith's organization, Fortify Rights, has been documenting mass graves and unmarked burial sites throughout southern Thailand. He took us to one of the sites. When Rohingya either escape from the trafficking syndicates or are, in some cases are found on the side of the road, they end up in the hospital. If they die in the hospital, the hospital calls a local community representative, essentially, who picks up the bodies and disposes of them. At another gravesite nearby, Smith told us why there's been very little follow-up by authorities. And you think there are sites like this pretty much all over the South? Yeah, absolutely. These, these types of grave sites, and actually some mass graves that are much bigger, 
dot the landscape throughout this entire region. Is anyone keep like are the authorities? Is anyone keeping track of, of these bodies and these people? And is anyone letting their relatives know? Casualty recording has been almost completely lacking. And the reason is to, to hide evidence, to hide what happens. Precisely. Uh, you can see right here, uh, these are unmarked graves just with a, with a stone next to them. Um, they look like they were recently buried. Uh, I count six. How do you guys generally find out about these sites or about, about these situations? Speaking to survivors, speaking to eyewitnesses. Uh, in some cases, we've been meeting with government officials as well, uh, government officials who are trying to do the right thing. We've also spoken with um, uh, investigators in the Thai Police Department who have indicated that, um, that uh, they did have information about mass graves, but the investigation didn't proceed. The UN has an estimate of roughly $200 million was earned in human trafficking in Southeast Asia specifically with regard to this population as well as some Bangladeshis since 2012. Who's profiting off this? Transnational criminal syndicates are profiting off of this. Uh, government officials, not only in Myanmar, but also in Thailand have been profiting off of this. People have, have become uh, hugely wealthy off of this trade in human beings. And no one's really doing much about it. That's right. And as so, some governments, such as the Thai government, uh, right now are attempting to convince the world that they are taking the situation of human trafficking very seriously. There's an ongoing trial right now against 91 people, in some cases government officials, who have been charged with criminal offenses um, related to the crime of trafficking. Unfortunately, there are huge problems with that trial. It, it appears as though it's a show trial, essentially. It has not even touched the tip of the iceberg. Those currently on trial are said to be mostly low-level offenders. While some higher-ups have been charged, sources told us most of the kingpins are not being pursued. So the real big bosses, the real kingpins, they've escaped. Yes, maybe they, they negotiated with the local authorities to hide evidences, and maybe they gave bribe. And also some of the human trafficker, those who are the big investors, they also have link with some government officers. They do business. So these government officers, they protect their business. But there is evidence to arrest the kingpins. They're just not using that evidence. They're not going after them. Yes, we are very disappointed because they, they are still escaped. They are not arrested. And it's not just Thai authorities that are alleged to be working with the trafficking gangs. Authorities in Myanmar are also colluding. Vice News obtained a recorded phone call between an activist in Yangon and a trafficker implicating the Myanmar Navy and military officials in taking bribes to allow trafficking. We've just arrived in Bangkok. Um, from all the research we've done and all the people we've spoken to, it seems that there are still a number of traffickers that are here in Bangkok, sort of hiding in plain sight. Um, one of them has agreed to speak to us. Uh, he's an alleged trafficker. Um, but it's sort of a really murky world. A lot of these alleged traffickers actually work with the police uh, and inform on some of their competition. Um, they also claim that they're humanitarians that are, that are helping out uh, trafficked and smuggled people. So it's really hard to tell um, what exactly is going on, but he's agreed to meet with us as long as we protect his identity. A source later informed us that this man was reputed to be a smuggler and not a trafficker. It may seem like splitting hairs, but the traffickers use violence and deception where smugglers simply move people illegally across borders. What can you tell us about the trafficking situation right now? It seems to us like things have slowed down for a second. Have you been involved in, in helping the government or police at all deal with the trafficking situation? People have told us that you were involved in trafficking. How do you respond to that allegation?
How high up do you think the corruption goes? The corruption is so widespread that the senior police investigator on the case has fled Thailand, fearing for his life. Major General Pawin Paksirin is currently seeking political asylum in Australia after implicating top officials in the Thai government, military, and police force involved in human trafficking. The human trafficking situation may have slowed down for now, but the conditions in Rakhine State show little signs of improvement. Worse, it seems as if the international community may be willing to accept the status quo, sacrificing the Rohingya for political expediency. Critics have alleged that the United Nations has prized maintaining good relations with the government over stopping the oppression of the Rohingya. These types of accusations against the UN are nothing new. In 2009, during the final stages of Sri Lanka's civil war, tens of thousands of civilians were killed by the army. The UN was criticized for failing to speak up and pressure the government in the lead up to the mass killings. When people face grave violations of human rights, they expect the United Nations to act. Yet in 2012, my internal review panel assessed UN action in the final stages of armed conflict in Sri Lanka as a systemic failure. The internal investigation concluded that there was a systemic failure at the UN due to a culture of trade-offs with the government, combined with reluctance among UN staff in Sri Lanka to stand up for the rights of people they were mandated to assist. In order to prevent something like this from happening again, the UN launched the Human Rights Upfront Initiative, which aimed to put protection of human rights above all else. Unfortunately, there are many human rights workers, including its own employees, who say that with the Rohingya, the UN is once again failing to protect vulnerable citizens, including allegedly turning a blind eye to mass atrocities in Rakhine State. We brought those allegations to the UN's resident coordinator in Myanmar, Renata Desalian. There's been recent accusations that the UN isn't doing enough and that they're complicit in crimes against humanity and other things that are happening there. Um, how do you respond to those allegations? The UN is actually doing quite a lot. We are advocating uh, for their human rights uh, at numerous forums uh, in Geneva, in New York, here locally. Um, the UN is, is doing more than anybody else, quite frankly, in trying to address the, the root causes. And uh, so I think that's a very unfair um, argument. We've spoken to, to people in NGOs. You know, what they're telling us is that there's a failure of the UN to push back on the government. There's sort of a, an appeasement process going on. Um, and they're concerned that the systems to prevent mass atrocities aren't in place right now. Mm. So there's no appeasement uh, going on whatsoever. The UN works in various um, ways. Uh, parts of the UN uh, are there to stand up and um, call a spade a spade. And that is exactly what's happening. Uh, I don't think anyone has spoken out as loudly as the UN on rights violations and uh, unacceptable situation in Rakhine State. So there's absolutely no complicity whatsoever. However, Vice News got a hold of leaked internal documents, including emails and a resignation letter of a mid-level official that show UN employees with mounting concerns about UN inaction, with some even questioning whether the UN is complicit in crimes against humanity. We asked Matt Smith to help walk us through the leaked documents and what they mean for the Rohingya. What do you make of, of the tone of, of these documents? The fact that there is accurate information that has been communicated and transmitted up the, the, the information food chain um, among some of these agencies is significant because it demonstrates that, 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 that people do or at least should know what's actually going on and what's been going on for decades. Um, there's no lack of information about what's happening. Um, uh, the response is the real issue. And there are people who are in positions to influence the situation in Rakhine State. And not only are they not doing it, but in some cases they've actually made the situation worse. These agencies want to stay within the good graces of the Myanmar authorities. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. They should be working with the authorities. The problem comes when there are these severe abuse is taking place, when atrocity crimes are taking place, and there's inaction. An internal review addressed the UN silence and inaction in Myanmar. And in one email, a UN employee writes, I am trying to be constructive in a discussion of potential risk of us being complicit to the commission of crimes against humanity. 
In another document, an employee raises alarm bells, saying, I'm extremely concerned about a repeat of the systemic failures by the UN to prevent large-scale violence as we have witnessed before. What do you think is behind this negligence from, from the UN and, and, and these agencies in terms of putting pressure on the government? There's a great amount of fear among and between agencies that are operational in Myanmar. Um, uh, fear that they will be evicted, like MSF, Doctors Without Borders, was evicted. In 2014, Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, a nonprofit medical humanitarian organization, was forced out of the country after it said it treated 22 people for injuries and wounds in Duchi Ardan, a village in Rakhine State where a massacre is alleged to have occurred with the participation of local authorities. The government refuted the statements, all the while refusing to allow an independent investigation and denying that a massacre occurred. The Duchi Ardan incident is a disturbing mystery, in which it is alleged that dozens of Rohingya were killed, including women and children, with the help of local authorities. 8,000 people fled the area, but no bodies were ever found. The government did its own investigations, concluding that no massacre occurred. But there are many who disagree with the government's findings. At any given time, I was the most senior human rights officer in the country and focused on Rakhine State. Michael Sheikh worked for the UN at the time and is the only international observer to gain access to the area in the aftermath of the incident. This is the first time he has spoken to the media about what happened. Can you tell us what you saw? I saw some very traumatized people who explain some very terrible things that had happened. Um, killings, they saw children being killed. Um, they explained that there were body parts in wells. It was very clear that people had experienced something very traumatic. Tens and tens of eyewitnesses who had claimed that this had happened. So you took your findings to the UN and, and what happened after that? We delivered it to the Myanmar government, saying these are, these are some very serious allegations we're hearing you have the responsibility to investigate these things. The government vociferously denied that anything was happening. Only the military and only the police were, were able to go and go out. There were travel bans, you couldn't move north and south on one of these roads. It provided perfect opportunity to scrub the area um, for nearly two weeks. A cover-up? Yeah, effectively, yes. We received information at the time that there were a number of killings taking place in Duchiradon. What happened after was a relatively sophisticated cover-up that successfully uh, influenced the thinking not only of uh, the diplomatic community, but also senior UN officials, including at the UN headquarters in New York. There was um, a lot of disagreement within the UN about uh, what did and did not take place in Duchiradon. Despite the detailed UN report citing numerous eyewitness accounts, Sheikh says UN higher-ups were persuaded by the government's denials. So essentially what happened, the UN sort of walked back this report and stopped putting pressure on the government? Yes, that's what happened. It prioritized its relationship with the government over the people that it was in the business of protecting. UN employees like Sheikh, who wanted to press the government for an independent investigation, and who were concerned with the way that the narrative was being altered, were silenced and intimidated by their superiors. In the leaked resignation letter, a mid-level official states she was told by her supervisor to never raise this with her or anyone else if you want to continue your career in the UN. I was instructed to rewrite history, she states. You know, we've seen uh, internal documents, including emails and resignation letter, that are saying that people who were speaking up about what happened to Jirtan and what happened, what's happening to the Rohingya were effectively being silenced or intimidated to, to stay quiet. Um, is that something you experienced as well? Yeah, I, I, not just with Duchi Artan. Um, prior to Duchi Artan, after Duchi Artan, after Duchi Artan, it got much worse, uh, I'll be clear. When you're talking about very nasty human rights abuses, it makes dialogue much more difficult. And what we see in the UN is that the leadership there doesn't want to have these frank and difficult discussions. They'd rather sideline them. They'd rather prioritize their relationship with the government and push aside those that have the facts. We've seen you know, some documents that were given to us about internal uh, UN sort of dissents. And from what some of the people that have worked here have told us is that they feel like the voices that are raised in concern about this are being suppressed or forced out and that there really isn't that much being done. Can you go into detail about what happened with Duchi Artan, why that was a controversy, um, and why the UN walked back on, on having an international investigation done? There were deep concerns about uh, an incident that was uh, 
very, very upsetting for, for everybody. Um, subsequent to that incident, um, it appears that uh, some of the allegations that were made do not appear to have been substantiated. So I think that it's unfair to say that the UN backed away from uh, calling for an investigation. The information that we subsequently learned uh, didn't corroborate the initial allegations that were, were made. Meaning that they don't think any sort of massacre occurred, there was no violence, there was no... What, what does that mean? Meaning that the UN didn't have enough uh, facts and was not able to ascertain enough facts that something actually uh, occurred uh, as allegated. Even though the MSF said that people were being treated for trauma and, and things along that? We understand that something happened and we understand people were treated for trauma, but there's a big difference between that and some of the allegations that were... But doesn't that call for an international investigation of some sorts? Well, there were, uh, as I understand it, inadequate information to, um, to proceed along those lines. Vice News confirmed that the UN sent its staff back to the Duce Yartan area two weeks after it submitted its initial report to collect additional information. What they found corroborated the initial findings that pointed to alleged mass atrocities. The UN and others were trying to make up for a disastrous moral failure in Sri Lanka and saw Myanmar as a mea culpa, that if they got Myanmar right, it could absolve them from the sins in Sri Lanka. There is a real desire to get it right in Myanmar. But the desire to get it right also prevented from people from looking at reality. This culture of we need to get it right, and if we challenge the government too much, it could ruin that relationship, but also challenge our good news story that we've been telling ourselves and telling the world. The government that had, that had just turned a corner was now perhaps complicit in crimes against humanity. It would ruin the narrative. It would ruin the narrative, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that narrative was too valuable um, to be tarnished. The good news narrative of Myanmar got a huge boost on March 30th, when Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy party were sworn into office, ushering in a new era. There's a lot of hope that reforms will continue as the country further transitions to democracy. Rohingyas in the camps themselves told us that they think things will change for the better with the NLD now in power. But the reality is that little has been done or even proposed with regard to the Rohingya. Great things are happening in Myanmar, but Rakhine State is a festering wound on that progress. The newly elected NLD has said that the situation in Rakhine State is not a priority. Even Aung San Suu Kyi, a Nobel Peace Prize winner and a darling of the international community, has been mostly silent when it comes to speaking up for the Rohingya. There is evidence that they have been yes, systematically Muslims targeted. Have been, uh, Muslims have been targeted, but also Buddhists have been uh, subjected to violence. But there's fear on both sides. And so well, there's this about fear. fear on both sides. You would accept, though, that the scale of the suffering is not equal on both sides. There are something like 140,000 Burmese Muslims displaced from their homes and living in camps. They're the ones who are bearing the brunt of this violence. I think there are many, many Buddhists who have also left the country for various reasons. And there are many Buddhists who are in refugee camps. We hear about this positive relationship now that the U.S. has with Myanmar, that the U.K. has with Myanmar, and it seems like there's this out-in-the-open ethnic cleansing that's happening, and meanwhile, it doesn't seem like much is being done. Some people have essentially been intoxicated by this romantic narrative that democratic change is sweeping through the country and that the situation will necessarily turn out great for all populations in Myanmar. And I think Part of the reason why the international community has not done more is because there are certain political and economic incentives to not having these inconvenient conversations with senior government officials. And for the international community to know what's happening and not do anything, this is essentially the hallmark of complicity. 